And I'm welcoming every one of you right here, right now to the Cafe of Dreams, the Master Mentor Series with myself, your host, Lynn Kitchen. And I have a special, special guest for you this evening, Mr. Ben Gay III. And I will be introducing Ben in just a moment. But before I do, I just want to take a moment and just wrap my arms around all of you who are now uh, entering into the uh, into this wonderful thing called the Zoom. It's it's fabulous that we have the technology that we can all be together um, and that we can see each other shortly. That is, um, I want to welcome all the people who have been reaching out to me, sending me questions that I'll be able to ask our wonderful guest, uh, Ben Gay, in, uh, in the course of this evening. And I also want to invite Ben um, into the opportunity to tell us a little bit about what he's up to, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but before we do, let me tell you a little bit about um, the Cafe of Dreams and the Master Mentor series. I am delighted to tell you that my passion is all about the power of mentorship as a way of life. And what if each one of us could always have a mentor and could always be a mentor, which means that having had great mentors, we can become better mentors. And if we each can not only have the wisdom of others to help us move up, um, up the ladder, of whatever it is that we want to improve and be be better, um, the best self that we could possibly be in every endeavor our, in our lives, then there's always someone to reach out to and pull them up in the same way. And with that, we can all grow better and faster and have an accelerated growth together. And I call this Mentorship is the ground wire to greatness because I believe that that is how we can all grow together. So a little bit about Master Mentor Series. I started out interviewing some great mentors of my own, Mary Morrissey, Les Brown, and the great late Dr. Wayne Dyer. And you can actually see a wonderful tribute video that I created with the three of them as they were sharing their stories of their mentorship with one man who mentored all three and his name was Jack Boland. And you can see that video and all of the other Master Mentor series on a YouTube, uh, which is called Mentors and Motivators by Lynn Kitchen. And I welcome you to go there and see some of our greats. And once we get our Ben Gay uh, part two there, Ben Gay part one is there already, so we'll add some more wonderful content for you. And this is all free because I believe in the power of mentorship. So tonight, my special guest is Ben Gay III, and he is going to share stories with us, stories about mentorship and who mentored him. And of course, wonderful news is that Ben Gay really is the last living protege of a wonderful mentor named Dr. Napoleon Hill. And Napoleon Hill, whom most of you know, was the author of Think and Grow Rich, the seminal Bible practically for not only all salespeople, but all, uh, the, really the foundation of the growth of the personal development industry. But in about the year 1967 to 1970, my guest, Ben Gay III, had the privilege and honor to be mentored by Napoleon Hill. Uh, that was when Ben was only about 23, 24, 25, something like that. We'll get the details. But what an amazing opportunity to speak with uh, somebody who really has the, the real memories of who Napoleon Hill really was in real life and what was it like being mentored by him. But that's not all. Um, ben was also mentored by some of the other great founders of the personal development industry, including Earl Nightingale. And you all remember the special record that Earl Nightingale produced, The Strangest Secret, which went on, on to produce over a million records back in the 1960s when that was the first talking record ever to make, uh, you know, make a record or recording, a smash recording. But 
That's not all. Uh, ben was also mentored by some of the very greatest salesmen and sales techniques and positive thinkers and personal development people in the world, including Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, which you all, I'm sure, fondly remember was the author of um, uh, The Power of Positive Thinking. Zig Ziglar, one of my favorites. Uh, Og Mandino, who wrote The Greatest Salesman in the World. And then, of course, Dr. Maxwell Maltz, who wrote a, a famous book about our, um, the, our, what was the name of that? Uh, well, I'll Psycho ask Ben. Cycle cybernetics. Thank you so much. Well, <laughs> Ben is standing in the in the wings here, giving me some direction. And not only that, but more great mentors uh, was an amazing gift to Ben as he was mentored by such greats as J. Douglas Edwards, W. Clement Stone, William Penn Patrick, Jim Newman. Merle Frazier. Now, some of these names may go back several, several years, and those of you who have been born not that long ago probably don't know some of these names, but I'm here to tell you that these are very, very famous names, Bill Dempsey, Ray Considine, um, and more. And not only that, but Ben has gone on to honor this whole profession of personal development by taking all of the master skills that were taught to him and now he has dedicated his life really over the last 20 30 years to teaching others and being a mentor to thousands and thousands of people who are in the who have have an interest in being the very best person that they can be is specifically in the area of sales training which is um, Ben's expertise and forte Ben is an author of over 12 books in the area of sales and have and has masterfully trained many, many people. So with that in mind, I am just pleased as punch to introduce my guest. Hello, Ben. Ben Gay the third. Hi, Hi ben. ben. Thanks for being with us. How are you? I'm wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. How are you? Splendid. We had a little <laughs> computer glitch before we got started. So I'm doing my um, yes. so, I so I don't have to kill anyone. Uh, for <laughs> well, I know. I mean, th this is the new age. And um, in the day that we are speaking about in Napoleon Hill's day and Earl Nightingale, and of course, Earl Nightingale was on the radio all the time in, in dealing with technology. But this is a new day and we, we're, we're dealing with things that they did, never did even think or imagine about. Um, so you are here for part two of this Master Mentor series. And first of all, I want to just thank you again, Ben, for being here for part one, which was an amazing introduction of uh, what it was like to be mentored by these greats. And tonight, really, we have so many questions that we didn't get to the last time. So the purpose of tonight's show is, is to see if we can get to some of those questions and, and dive deeper into this topic of mentorship, who mentored you and how are you mentoring others, so that we can then ask the, the people that are on our panel uh, t live tonight um, what their questions are. And before we do that, I just want to take a, sh a moment to shout out to all of the peoples who have written me questions on, you know, I can't make it tonight, but I want the replay and I want, here's a question that I have for Ben Gay. You have a lot of fans and followers, Ben. Well, they're very kind. They've been good to me over the years. Good, good. Well, um, let's just start again by honoring some of these greats then shall we sure uh, and last time you you had the most well, we had a lot of fun talking about napoleon hill and what that was like and who he really was as a person and uh so why don't we just start there and kind of do a little recap about the wonderful mentors that you've had and what what was it like and who do you think you became as a result of being mentored by some of these greats ben well, I absorbed all I could. Uh, in the early days, I wasn't bright enough to really get what I should be getting from those nice people. Uh, but they were patient. They waited for me to come around. And uh, as a result, I got to absorb. You, you said earlier uh, that uh, we should 
remembered to be mentors and and uh, find mentors and so on, uh, and which triggered me to remember that you, everyone listening to this, you are a mentor now, uh, whether you know it or not, and uh, you are actively mentoring people because they're watching you to see what you do. So the problem is, if you're if you're not a good mentor, and I certainly wasn't in those early days. Uh, if you're not a good mentor, you're leading people astray. So since you are, becoming a mentor is not a goal to aspire to, you already are one. Uh, so become a good mentor, be a positive example, uh, might be one of the challenges. I, uh, Dr. Hill was very good with me about that, of drawing me up short from time to time, always in, in private. I swear to you, I don't recall a single time that he said anything other than the mildest of suggestions, and even then in a general manner, we were working on a problem or something where somebody might have overheard it. But if it was something I needed to do differently, or he thought I should do differently, it was always in private. And I would sometimes, out of the corner of my eye, he usually sat to my left at the end of my long conference table desk. Uh, when he was in town, he sat to my left, and I, if I said, something I, I'm thinking to myself, oh, I wonder if I should have done that better. I'd, out of the corner of my eye, I'd see him writing furiously on his ever-present legal pad. And I thought, well, I don't have to even try and remember that because when everybody leaves, I'm going to hear about it again. <laughs> he has already made a note. And then usually it would be very short and succinct. You know, in his book, she, as he told me one time, you have to fill pages. So you use adjectives and adverbs and so on in person. He was very uh, uh, concise, not abrupt, but concise. Uh, don't do it. Focus. Uh, learn to be quiet. <laughs> you know, oh, stuff just, like that. Just like little small orders or yeah, yeah. few phrases. And I think you had mentioned, he said, uh, in, in right after a meeting that you had with maybe some clients or something, he would give you one sentence Directed. Yeah, here's how you could do that better or whatever. Zig, I may have told you this before, and pardon me if I'm repeating myself, but Zig and I think J. Douglas Edwards, I forget, two or three people took me to lunch one day. They wanted to have a private chat with me, and I said to Dr. Hill, you want to go? Because he could go anywhere. He had free reign in the building in my office. He didn't have to knock on any doors. Uh, he didn't want to be a distraction, so he could open the door, walk into any meeting, and just sit down. And... Uh, so I asked him, do you, we're going to lunch. You want to go? And he said, no, I'm fine. I've got work to do. So we went to lunch. We were gone about two hours. I came back and he said, when no one was around, what was that about? And I said, well, that was to get me to change my name from Ben Gay uh, to something else because Ben Gay was a distraction because of the product. And then gay didn't just mean happy anymore about that time, late mid sixties, late sixties. Uh, and so on. So they want me to change my name. And he said, ignore them. And ignore the subject, them. Ignore them. And the subject never came up again. We didn't discuss why I should ignore them or anything. He just said, ignore them and went back to writing. And uh, so I did. And uh, it was it was never a discussion. No, why do you say that? That night at the house, uh, he usually stayed with us when he was out. That night at the house, it never came up. I forgot to mention it to my wife at the time. She's passed now, Marsha Gay. Uh, I forgot to mention it to her. And, and she said, how'd your day go? And we said, fine. Went up and shot some pool probably while she fixed dinner. And that was it. And that could have been sort of, I'm not sure you and I would have been talking now if I had changed my name. It's a tremendous advantage in that people don't forget it. Well, it's interesting so, that, that uh, you had that discussion with, Napoleon Hill himself, whether to yep. change your name or not. Yep. <laughs> he said, well, ignore them. I had the discussion uh, with Zig and, and Doug Edwards. I had oh, the, re the resolution, the resolution. The discussion from Dr. Hill. Ignore the them. The edict. Ignore yeah. this. <laughs> That's wonderful. Let's, well, for the benefit of people who are just coming on to the program now and maybe who didn't have a chance to watch last time when we were together. Ben, would you mind going back just a little bit and giving people a historic viewpoint of how was it that you had the opportunity, first of all, to be mentored by uh, Napoleon Hill? And you mentioned that he was in your office and had free reign. Uh, 
how did that come about? Could you just give a quick overview that, you know, he not only uh, was part of your company as a 23 or 24 year old um, entrepreneur at the time who had a successful company, but isn't it true that you actually hired him to, uh, to help you. Well, I wish I was that bright. The truth is oh. I didn't. Somebody else said to me the other day, well, you were wise enough to hire Dr. Hill as a mentor. Uh, I, I paid him the second year and, and uh, probably the third year, he died about two and a half years after we started. But uh, the first year, uh, he was brought. He was in the building to give the owner of the company, William Patrick, an award and to present him with a book in which uh, he listed William Penn Patrick as one of the four or five greatest people I think currently living. And uh, I, I didn't know he was in the building. Uh, I'd never met him. Didn't think I was ever going to meet him. I read his book because the day I joined the business, uh, a friend of mine, you had him on your list a minute ago, Bill Dempsey handed me a copy of Think and Grow Rich and uh, an old scratched up record, which is right over my shoulder in a bookcase of The Strangest Secret by uh, Earl Nightingale. So I had read the book. I'd listened to the record many times. It was easier than reading. And uh, uh, so there's a knock on my door and the door opens and there stands William Penn Patrick with a little old man. And I didn't know the little old man. He didn't look like the pictures I'd seen with that high collar, the one you just showed a minute ago, uh, looking like he was stuffed in the cigar store <laughs> window or something. Uh, he was just a guy on a cane. And uh, I had no idea who he was. And I got up, and the ceremony with the book and the, had already gone on in the back and they were heading out the door. One of those things about how life works, I'm sure Bill would have forced the issue, but I often wondered what if I'd been in the bathroom? They were headed out of the building and uh, my office was about the last stop before he got to the front door. And uh, that's when I met him. And I'm thinking, well, if I'd been in the bathroom, would Bill have waited? He probably had a plane he had to catch or something. But it was, uh, I stood up, went around, said, hi, my name's Ben Gay. And he said, uh, Bill Patrick said, uh, Ben, this is Dr. Napoleon Hill. And I said, oh, didn't recognize him. And uh, blah, 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 back and forth, all the niceties that we Southerners, all three of us were Southerners, uh, Columbia, South Carolina, Roper, North Carolina, and me, Atlanta, Georgia. So we did all the Southern stuff. And then Bill said uh, to me, uh, Ben, I've retained Dr. Hill to be your, I'm not positively used the word mentor and we weren't using coach yet. I think what he did was he hired a friend for me, <laughs> an, an older, wiser friend. But I've retained Dr. Hill to work with you. I know there are times, I was 25 that day. Uh, I know there were times when you're probably afraid to make the long walk down to my office. By coincidence, we were at the each end of a long hallway. And uh, you wonder if you're going to get fired, if you're concerned or confused or what have you. So Dr. Hill is now your personal um, coach. Well, I'll, I'll use mentor but it wasn't that at the time. He's now your uh, personal mentor and you can tell him anything. And sometime we have a little more time, I'll show you how I tested that because I didn't believe that he would not say anything to a guy who just hired, who had just paid him $50,000 to be my friend. That's in 1967 dollars. So he paid him roughly a half of the $450,000, $500,000 to work with me. And uh, so I tested the theory. It was right. Whatever I told Dr. Hill stopped right there. I could have told him I'd murdered Bill Patrick's sister. I don't think it would have gone any farther. He might have encouraged me to call the police, but he wouldn't have run down the hall and told Bill. So that became our uh, friendship and relationship in the very beginning. And probably the first couple of visits were sort of wasted because I thought I was babysitting an old man. He was 84 the day we met. I thought I was babysitting an older man because Bill liked him and so on. And, you know, I was probably a little condescending. It wasn't like, oh, I'm sitting in front of the wisest man that's lived in the last hundred years. Suck it up. So that came, though, within a couple of visits. And a couple of visits mean a couple of two, three, four day visits to my office and my home. And we became buddies, but we never lost, I never lost track of the pecking order. 
the pecking order was he was Dr. Hill and I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Well, yeah. you know, we have, we do have a lot of questions that have come in and I've been collecting questions for a couple of weeks from people who have, uh, thank you again for everybody who have mailed in your questions. Um, I have a few that I'd like to start right here, right now regarding uh, Dr. Napoleon Hill, if it's all right with you, Ben. Sure. Um, one Being of a the, Southerner, I'll try and keep my answers short. <laughs> all right. Well, one of them has to do with uh, how did you know you were ready for mentorship by Dr. Hill? And what did, why do you think that you were, or did you recognize the value when you had Dr. Hill mentoring you? Did you recognize the value? Well, that grew. Yes over time but time pretty quick fortunately i'm glad i didn't mess around for two two years or something drawing from it it probably took about two visits enjoyed his company and uh he had a very dry sense of humor uh but i didn't uh i wasn't smart enough to know i needed a mentor i promise you if bill patrick said i want you to hire william Penn Patrick and you pay him fifty thousand dollars i would have said no uh i just didn't see that value I wasn't smart enough to see the value. I should have. Um, so it was, it was sort of forced on me. I, you know, I'd like to, yes, I was wise and I gathered all these people around me. Well, after Dr. Hill, I did start gathering and I doubled back to some people I'd already known and worked with that I realized I hadn't really taken advantage of, and I mean that in a positive way, or allow them to take advantage of me in a positive way. Zig and I, Zig Ziglar, joined the same business on the same day, Wednesday, September 15th, 1965. It was a Wednesday at noon. Tell um, us the name of the business again. Holiday Magic Cosmetics. We were the largest direct sales multi-level marketing company in the world at the time and, uh, the, and, and got bigger after that. So that's, I'd known Zig. We had worked together and, and been head-to-head -head in sales contests and everything. Uh, but Dr. Hill sort of taught me that I needed to double back because Zig could teach me a whole lot where I was just treating him like one of the guys. He was 18 years older than I was. Zig was in the Navy uh, the day I was born. So there, there was that spread. He wasn't just one of the guys, if nothing else. He was 18 years older, been in selling longer, a lot longer. Uh, so I doubled back, started taking, uh, paying way more attention to Zig than I had. Uh, thanks to the relationship with Dr. Hill, I sought out, I was already listening to his stuff on the radio, but sought out and uh, enrolled uh, Earl Nightingale in our cause. He became the voice of Holiday Magic and the voice of all of our other companies, which had different products, different names, but the same marketing plan. So if, and the same script. So if a script would work for Holiday Magic with Earl reading it, it would also work for Stay Power motor oil additives or Bob Cummings vitamins or what have you. So then I started gathering them. I, 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 somebody said one time that I was sort of a poor man's Malcolm Forbes with his uh, Fabergé egg collection. You know, I, <laughs> I, I got Napoleon Hill forced on me and I went back and, and looked at Zig differently than I had before. And uh, when I met Og Mandino, I didn't, he was doing seminars for us. Uh, I didn't go, hi, Og, uh, you know, be sure and keep it short because I'm going on at three or something. I thought, Og Mandino, huh, I probably ought to pay attention. So it, that changed my thinking. I'll tell you something else, you, you, didn't, you had no way of knowing to ask it, but something he really taught me that was clever. J. Douglas Edwards, he's gone now, so we can talk openly, was a jackass. Uh, but on stage, he was magnificent, and he, was a, uh, he had a wealth of knowledge about selling. So much so, I wrote a book called Sales Closing Power, which is not really nothing but my notes from working with J. Douglas Edwards and uh, uh, his actual seminar recordings. I had them transcribed cleaned them up for reading. Sometimes things spoken casually from the stage don't read well, but sales closing power is sort of a tribute to Doug Edwards. But I was telling Dr. Hill one day about, uh, I guess Doug had been out there and maybe said something that I wasn't terribly pleased with. And I said, you know, to Dr. Hill, 
I'm making up stories now because I don't remember exactly what I said, but I remember the gist of it. And the gist of it was, I really don't like him. I just really don't like him. I'm thinking of not using him anymore. And Dr. Hill said, well, why'd you guys hire him? I said, well, because he's a great sales trainer. And, uh, and uh, his booming voice and his presence and all. And he said, then separate that. You don't have to like him. You don't have to like everything about him. But draw from him those things that he really does have to offer. And I think about people... Uh, famous people, I won't name names, but there are several running through my head right now who on stage were absolutely magnificent in their personal life. They had some issues. Uh, and it goes back to the people my family listened, my mom and dad listened to. You know, I, I sort of knew the background of some of them and all the way up to people the kids are listening to today. But he taught me how to separate it. If you, got, if you have a person who is wonderful at selling, then you don't have to endorse his other behavior or like it, but draw from him the selling aspects. From somebody else, it might be, I have a dear friend who's gone now who was a human behavioral psychologist. We had uh, a few differences here and there. I loved him, but we had a few differences. But I always tried to remember what Dr. Hill taught me. You're, the thing he can teach you is what, what only a human behavioral psychologist can teach you. Draw that. Interesting. So, so really pay attention to people's strengths. Um, yeah, you can learn from their weaknesses, but you don't have to indulge in that. Got it. So uh, he, he really helped to teach you how to deal with difficult people. Yeah, and draw from them, not discard them. Because Doug Edwards was seconds away from getting the phone call that said, we're not going to need you in Atlanta or New York or whatever, whatever. And I happened to say it out loud. And Dr. Hill had that little chat with me. I didn't make the phone call. And Doug and I worked together successfully for several more years. Well, that is an interesting um, thing to remember. But let me ask you this in, regarding Dr. Hill. Um, you mentioned in the art part one that he also taught you the number one lesson that stayed with you all your life and as it relates to your time, uh, time management. And uh, could you tell us the story about how to use your calendar? And we, we actually, I actually had two people email me this question again and said, please ask Ben, what was it that Dr. Uh, Hill said about how should we become successful by managing our time and our calendar? Could you well, elaborate on that? Yeah, it's spilled over into many different aspects, but the, the viewers can take what I'm going to say, and then you can just twist it a little bit and apply it in almost every aspect of your life. Dr. Hill asked me one day, again, staying at the house and aware of my schedule. I was giving 300 seminars a year, and you got to get to and from 300 them. a year? Yeah. Wow. You know, only 60 days not on the road. That's well, to get to and from the seminar, you know, you go out and hit five. I once did 33 cities in 11 days, thanks to the Learjet. I wonder if you have the standing record. Do you know? Um, I, Do you have the Guinness well, Book of people, World's Record? <laughs> there were people with me on that trip, so they all share the record. But uh, he was aware of that I was spending a lot of time on the road and busy, busy. And when I was home, you know, and when you're young, it's sort of hard to get deflated. I'm Mr. Gay, and I just spoke to 5,000 people. Well, my first big talk, uh, and our second big talk was 15,000 people in the Long Beach arena. I'd never seen 15,000 people in one place in my life except to the Georgia Tech football game. And no one asked me to address them. So I was, you know, you're a little puffed up and standing ovations. If, if I used to think, I wonder if I burped, if I could get a standing ovation. Uh, so full of myself and busy, busy, Dr. Hill said to me one day, how do you handle your family time? And I said, well, I tuck it into the nooks and crannies of my schedule. And he said, we found the problem. That's your problem, huh? Yeah, that's the problem. That's your problem. Yeah, he said, so what I want you to do is get a calendar. And I have one, I have to disconnect to go get it. But my daily reminder from at a glance, if you want to look it up, it's called at, it's a company. I got nothing to do with it. I don't know anybody there. 
but I've gotten my calendar from them every year at a glance, my daily reminder. I'll get you the model number before we hang up. And uh, I start, it looks like a hymnal, full page for every day. He said, start writing down what, you, what you're going to do. And at first of all, it was on a legal pad, but then, I, then he got me to get a calendar. And uh, he said, I said, okay, well, let's see tomorrow. I've got a meeting about something. He said, no, 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 no. We're just going to put the family first, and we're going to tuck the business into the nooks and crannies. And I don't remember if it was instantly or over time, but what we evolved into and what Gigi and I still uh, Gigi is my wonderful wife. What Gigi and I evolved into is we take, at least, you know, we do other things, but sacrosanct are four or five four-day weekends. We like to go over to the coast. I don't, I don't do two weeks well. I, I think they'd take me out in a, in a straight jacket if I was that long away from things. But uh, we go over to the coast, Mendocino usually, or Fort Bragg. I'm talking about California. Used to go to San Francisco before it turned into a garbage dump. Uh, Big Sur, we like. So we'll do that for like four days. Wednesday night, we leave. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we're there. And we come back early Monday morning or maybe start back late Sunday night. So I write that in the calendar and then I yellow highlight it. And those four to five weekends depends on how they fall with the holidays when we map them out. Nothing happens. I mean, you can call me and say, I got 50,000 people that want to hear you at the Rose Bowl and the fee is $50,000. I go, all right. And I look in my calendar. If it says Mendocino, I can't make it. We go to Mendocino because I found that if you start slipping and sliding here and there, it gets easier to justify and pretty soon you're back to uh, 300 seminars a year. Uh, the other thing Gigi made me do, uh, she made she make me do it, but it was a condition of marrying her, so <laughs> I did it, uh, was we went from 300 seminars a year to 24 a year, no more than three in any one month. And uh, when you figure a day getting there and a day getting back, unless you can combine them, even that's a good deal of time away from the house and no local clients, Placerville, California, that wasn't a hard sacrifice to make, but no local clients. She'd heard stories from my previous wife about uh, in Marin County going into a restaurant and we weren't, we weren't able to have dinner because local distribu distributors, contest winners, local distributors from each of the five companies I was running would come over, sit down. Hi, me and the missus, we're here from Ohio. We won that contest. You know, oh, that's a lovely tomato on your salad. Do you mind if I just have a bite? <laughs> well, <laughs> and so Gigi didn't want to go through that. So I get it. No local So the, clients, so the, so no the big speech. rocks, put, putting the rig, big rocks on the calendar first. It, yeah. Uh, the big rocks for your family on the calendar first. And is that, was that because uh, Dr. Hill uh, felt that th your happiness was... Was sacrosanct. Yeah, well, yeah, and he didn't Sacrosanct. have a real good family life. Mm -hmm. uh, he was not a happy camper, and, and a wife or two weren't happy. And his relationship, he told me, I never met his kids, but his relationship with most of his family was not very good for whatever reason. But one of the reasons was he didn't put them first, he told me. So it, it was so easy. See, if you're a time organization freak like I am, I, I, I thought, oh, if I'm going to block out this time and that's not going to be business. How am I going to get business done? It fits that, you know, the work expands to fit the time allowed and it contracts to find the time, uh, the activity contracts to find the time to do it. You know, like they're putting on a stage show, they're always racing around the last minute, but at the right time, the orchestra strikes up, the curtain opens, and the show goes on. So I, I found it's just not a problem, if, but, but it would be a problem if I said, what we're going to try and do, Gigi, is we're going to try and go over to the coast four times a year. So, you know, keep your eye open for a, a, an opening. Well, in the meantime, those days get filled up with other things. So first, first that's the key. First. Then how, but, so that comes first, and then yep. how do you apply that once that's in? How have you applied that systematically to your success? Well, Dr. Hill, uh, again, now you got to really utilize the days you have. 
So Dr. Hill one day said, uh, where's your list of things that you have to do? Well, I'd heard the story Earl Nightingale tells in The Strangest Secret about the efficiency expert who called on Charles Schwab and, and his name was Ivy Lee and he told him to list the things and that he was supposed to do tomorrow. Uh, I heard that story. I've, I've listened to that record, probably a th record and or video now and so on, probably a thousand times or more. I'd heard the story. I can do the story. Uh, but I wasn't doing it. He said, where's your list of what you're going to do? Well, I don't know. And it, that evolved into a, a thing. He said, Ben, if you, you can't move up unless you replace yourself. I didn't know where I was going to move up. I was already president of the company unless the owner died. I was pretty much boxed in, but that was fine. Uh, other opportunities would come along. I said, so if you had to replace yourself tomorrow, what would you have him or her do? And I said, well, I'd, you know, I'd give him a list. He said, well, good, write it down. So I wrote down a list with his coaching of the things that person, man or woman, should do every day if they had my job. And uh, when I got done, he said, now write your name at the top of the list, and there's what you do every day. Now I have Marty. Marty was my executive assistant, actually ran the company, I think. Uh, have Marty ask her to type it up. So she did. And ever since, I've had a list. It's varied over the years what's on it but a list that is typed up, bold type, run off a dozen copies or so. And when I come in in the morning, there's the list. These are the things I do every day without fail, no matter what. Uh, and it could be as simple as uh, check, num check numbers, which means look at the bank balances. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't like to be surprised. I check them Monday, Monday through Friday. Uh, check the bank balances, clear voicemail, so on. And I, and I like the accomplishment of marking them out. So I have these India markers, you know, it's the one with the string down the side and you tear it and, and re uh, reveal more of the crayon. And I mark them out as I go, great sense of achievement. And then I go to the calendar because the calendar doesn't have things I do every day. It has things I decided to do today. Uh, you're on it and it, it won't be crossed out, you're on it and highlighted, and it won't be crossed out till we say goodbye to each other today. But I've known that for two months. So if somebody asked me to do something today, I look at the calendar, no, I'm with Lynn. Can't do well, that. I am, I'm so privileged to be on your calendar and not <laughs> that's really great. Um, Thank you. So I, and you it, know, it, when we were talking about family first, I, I did get a person who had written in and asked about your opinion on, uh, on developing relationships um, with your wife. And the question actually was, how do you choose the right woman for your life? Now, I'm just asking you because uh, that was the question. How do you choose the right woman for your life? And how do you date your wife? How do you date your wife so that you have a great uh, affair all your life, not just a marriage. Tell you, Q, so one, I'm in love with her. And uh, I don't, many times during the day or week or my life, there's an opportunity to do something or say something or whatever. And I always run it through the filter of, are you willing to re risk your relationship with Gigi for that? And the answer is always no. So if it's something that could, could affect the relationship, I don't do it or say it or act on it or whatever. Uh, we have, uh, my financial advisor told me we eat out too much, but we generally during the day graze, you know, popcorn or this or that or breakfast. I'm a pretty good breakfast eater, but dinner we eat out uh, oh, four or five times a week, usually not a fancy dinner necessarily, but we eat out. I don't want her to have to cook. I don't want to do the dishes. I promised her when she waited for me during an awkward time in my life for six years that when I got back, if she accepted me, I would, she'd never have to wash a dish again or do any laundry again, for instance. And I have sort of forgot about it a couple of times and she reminded me. And then it dawned on me, we, she hasn't washed a sock in 22 years. <laughs> <laughs> Nice, so, nice so you, life. <laughs> my, my dad said, if you want to be a king, treat your lady like a queen. That makes you a king. And he said, you should always do 60% of, put forth 60% into the relationship, 40 for her. Years later, I found out that he told my wife that she should put in 60%, only 40% for me. And when I asked him about it, he said, well, 
I was putting a little slack in there. I figured if, <laughs> if do the math, it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 I figured if I lucked out, you'd each be given 60, that's 120, and how, what could go wrong? So that's when really I, cute. When I, yeah, one, I fell in love with GD, two, I started dating her, and I've never stopped dating her. Uh, that's what we do. Cute story, we were in a local pub one, one night, uh, I'll, give them a, a, I'll give them a plug, Powell Brothers on Main Street, it's a little beer and wine and seafood place. And... Uh, I, it was no, we, were, we started out standing at the bar. So uh, I'm standing at the bar talking to her. And finally, we either got a table or we were done. Maybe we ate shrimp cocktails at the bar. I don't know. We're heading towards the door. And this lady stops, Gigi, takes her by the arm and said, are you going home with him? And Gigi said, yes. And he, she said, I don't doubt it. He's been hitting on you all night. <laughs> That's didn't cute. realize we were husband and wife. I guess with me standing her sitting, it looked like the typical guy trying to pick up somebody. But he's been hitting on you all night. And I thought, what a nice compliment. Um, I'm glad it still shows. That's lovely, Ben. Well, congratulations for that. You know, it's good because what, we have one person in the chat who just said, you know, it's nice to hear these stories, especially it, as it relates to um, maybe some of your mentors who didn't have such a great home life or relationships and you know it's nice to know that's that these great people that we hear about and lionize um are are human beings they have had frailties and perhaps failures in their lives and i know you know it's um it's a lesson for all of us i wanted to kind of change the topic now a little bit into the area of frailties as it relates to failure and we touched on this a little bit last time but Many of the questions that came in have to do about the pivot point of failing, failing, maybe in business, but maybe just in, maybe in a relationship, but also maybe in failing or being disappointed in yourself and somehow coming down to a pivot point and then rising again like the phoenix that pivot point being a very, very teachable lesson. Most mentors are, uh, are probably called upon for their wisdom and expertise in the tough time. Tell us what, what were some of those tough times for you and how did you call upon mentors to help you? Um, Dr. Hill helped me through a very difficult time. Freud wrote that when you turn th three horrible things can happen to a man, he said, probably be anybody, but in those days, people talked about men more. Freud said the worst, three worst things that can happen to a man are he turns 30. I assume today he would bump that up a little bit, but you know, you're halfway through life or whatever. Right. He used to drop dead at 60. So uh, you turn 30 you get fired and your father dies. I had all three happen to me in a six month period. Turned 30, got fired, my father died. And uh, it really uh, brought me to my knees. And uh, it, it, I don't think at, at the time it wasn't like, oh, wow, here it comes. It was just a horrible time. And shortly after that, the house, the big house in Marin was foreclosed on and the car, fancy cars were towed away. And I drove into this town in 1976 with a nickel in my pocket, having had three or four million dollars cash in the bank routinely before. So a series of bad decisions. Well, you shake it off. I, would, I don't mean it was easy, but you shake it off. I shook it off and started the 800 call center industry, first one in the world and uh, built it into a big business. When I was talking to my mother one day on the phone, she, she knew that the end had come. And she said, what are you going to do now? And I said, well, I'm starting. I got this new idea. We're going to start an 800. We didn't call it a call center in the f first few months that evolved, but we're starting an 800 answering service, I think I call it, and uh, for speakers and so on. And I'm having 800 lines put in, and, and which back, back then, by the way, cost $10,000 a month in advance for 240 hours at the end of the month, you got a bill for the next 10,000 per line and any overtime from the month before. It was not like today calling the phone company and adding $10 a month to your bill to, to get an 800 line. So I figured out a way to timeshare it. 
and I get a lot of people to be clients all calling the same phone number with ring over lines. My mother said, have you ever thought about getting a job? And, and I said, you know, the, it never crossed my mind to tell you the truth. <laughs> it was, what do you do next? So you, you shake it off and you move on. That was a little bit of a downer. And losing my dad was a downer. And I went, drew, went and drew on what Dr. Hill had taught me about how you have to sometimes compartmentalize things and put this over here for the moment and over here and deal with what uh, you can deal with. In 1976, 1986, somebody buzzed me from downstairs in this big building we were running and said, can I, uh, oh, may I, uh, is there anyone, do you have any visitors? I said, no, Roy, come on up. He said, no, that isn't what I meant. Downstairs, they had visitors crawling all over the place. The FBI was raiding our office because some people had told some lies about the company because they didn't get the, all their money back uh, in a marketing plan division and so on. So that started a four year odyssey, including a year long trial. And uh, my attorney wasn't bright enough to tell me that when the government comes after you, you lose. I knew I was innocent, sat down with the family. They knew I was innocent. All my friends, many of whom worked for me, we all knew we were innocent. So I said, I'm fighting it. If my attorney had been a little smarter, he would have said, no, 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 let's find something to plead out to. Uh, overdue traffic tickets. These people who've been bribing to get their kids in college are about to discover this the hard way. Fifteen mm -hmm. of them pled not guilty today. This will, they'll look back on it as one of the worst days of their life. Um, so I decided to fight it. And then they came to me with an offer and said, all right, do three years. And under what's called old law, three years meant you'll do no less than one year, no more than two, unless you start stab a guard. So I could have done one to two years on a three-year sentence. I said, no, nope, I'm innocent. So I went through a year-long trial, longest trial in the history of the Ninth Circuit, which is out here on the West Coast. A uh, year-long trial, and I'm thinking I'm one of the world's greatest salespeople, 12 jurors. I only got to get one. <laughs> How difficult can that be, especially if you're innocent? Well, they uh, listened to the trial for a year, then found me guilty. And then I went in for sentencing, and I wasn't really worried about it. I thought it would be sort of interesting. I worked at San Quentin for five years, so I wasn't afraid of prison. you know. And uh, it would be sort of interesting, uh, sentenced to three years, do one, behave, come back. You have more stories to tell. Go up in front of the judge, Judge uh, Schwartz. Uh, and uh, he says, Mr. Gay, you're one of the brightest people I've ever met. And, you know, it's, I've actually enjoyed being with you for a year. And I said, well, thank you, Your Honor. I'm thinking they're going to throw me a testimonial dinner. So it really breaks my heart to sentence you to 15 years. That's wow. no less than five, no more than 10 if you don't stab a guard. And, uh, and then the first day... I was there, I checked, self-surrendered on a Friday afternoon. The first morning I was there, I missed a count. I went down to the chapel to pray and get my wits about me, not knowing their routine. I knew all about counts at San Quentin, but I, I know somehow this just seemed different and looser. It didn't look like an old dungeon. And uh, so I was in the chapel praying and meditating while the entire, all three prisons there shut down because they thought they had a missing inmate. They believed that I took a look around, decided I didn't like it, and figured out a way to get out of there. So when they found me, they handcuffed me. First time that had happened. Uh, it didn't happen during the raid. didn't happen when they indicted me. didn't happen during the trial. didn't happen when I was found guilty. Or any time in the, I think, four months from when I was found guilty to when I was supposed to show up at prison voluntarily. Suddenly, I'm being handcuffed, and the correction officer says, you're under arrest. And I said, well, well I sort of thought that's what prison was. <laughs> you know. So I'm laughing with him and so on. They take me across the street to the big house, the serious prison. I was in a medium security prison at that point. They take me across the street, and they throw me in solitary confinement in the hole. And the two bunks, I was by myself, but they had two steel bunks. No mattress, no sheets, no nothing. They had stripped me down and taken my shoelaces so I guess I wouldn't hang myself. 
So now I'm sitting in my underwear in a maximum security prison in solitary confinement. And I sat on the bench. I looked up and I said, Jesus, you have my undivided attention. What do you want? <laughs> it took that long and all those events for me to go, okay, you got my attention. So and that was like a point of surrender. Uh, yeah. Of surrender. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, was, I was through laughing and joking. What do you want? And I'm not saying he talked to me. I've never heard God's voice, but I, I know God's pressure. It's, it's, to me, it's like an atmospheric pressure change when he wants me to go in some direction. The message I got was, go back to doing your work. So after five days in the hole, I reported back to the FCI, Federal Correctional Institute, I think it's called. And within a week, I was running their education department. Uh, I was teaching public speaking. I had to borrow the name Toastmasters to get it approved quickly. Toastmasters didn't know I existed, and I didn't know what their program was, but I knew how to teach public speaking. been doing it for years, so I was teaching Toastmasters. Then in time, I was teaching sales and marketing and public speaking. I was doing exactly in prison for six years, one month, one day, and two hours. Uh, I was doing exactly in prison what I do on the outside. The difference was I was getting paid $35 a month from the prison and later a good deal more, but $35 a month from the prison and inmates, when you do them a favor, they pay you in the coin of the realm. Since cigarettes weren't allowed there, San Quentin, it was cigarettes. It's Lompoc. It was cans of tuna. Now you can only eat so many cans of tuna, but you can trade them for something else. My locker was packed with tuna. I couldn't get the door shut, but I went to mentoring. Here's a book. This is called Don't Let Your Past Hold You Back, The Redemption of a Gangster by M. Lamont Bowens. In this book, he mentions me throughout the book, but there's about a chapter and a half that's all me. He was my first, other than general influence when you're teaching classes, he was my first major mentoring project, 18-year-old drug dealer, no high school education, um, raised on the, in the barrios or barrios, I never know how to pronounce that, of San Diego, uh, grew up all of his idols, had big Cadillacs, fur coats, floppy hats, and were involved in gun battles on a regular basis. Lamont, nine years ago, Gigi and, I, Gigi and I didn't have to pay a dime, but we guaranteed loans along the way. We got him through, I got him through high school at Lompoc. He got out, we guaranteed his loans, got him through college. Then we guaranteed his uh, uh, entrance into San Francisco State Law School. And now he is Lamont Bowens. A, we adopted him. And B, uh, he's been a successful attorney now for eight years which you're not supposed to be able to do, but I didn't tell him that. I said, you can do anything you want to do. So uh, coming, coming from those background and yep. from prison, you can do anything you want to do. And right. so he was your mentee in prison and you started doing what you knew how to do in the circumstances right. where you were, found yourself yep. uh, right or wrong. And certainly it was on not your preference it was not my preference, no. Not your preference. Jimmy said, well, you were found sent to prison to save guilty. Mont and a lot of others. And I said, well, that's nice, but I would have rather met him on the outside, <laughs> you know, sure. at, at a sales and marketing class at the Hilton. So uh, I want to bring this kind of, got. I want to, yeah, that's it. You have to deal with what you've got. I want to kind of bring that full circle now in terms of, mentoring. Um, what, we have a question here. What What is the best advice you have ever received from anyone? And I, I wanted to underscore that question. Thank you, Sharon. Is because um, if you take a look at your life and you've been up and you've been down uh, and then you came back up again, Ben, um, and that is, you, you have covered a lot of real estate, a lot of emotional um, wisdom probably that you have now as a result of these experiences. So you probably can be a mentor like no one else to many, many people. Um, we, we really want to hear from you. Not only is what is the one piece of advice that you've really taken into your heart through all of this ups and downs, and then maybe tell us what is the one thing that you feel like you have the most precious thing to give 
as a result of all this? Love, I'll answer the last one first. I love people. They feel that I love them and that lifts people up. Lamont Bowens told me the other day, and I think it's in the book, but he told me the other day in a phone call, he said, Ben, you don't understand what you did for me. The first time we met, you said, Lamont, you're a winner. He said, no one in my life had ever said that to me. You're a winner. And he said, you kept saying it over and over and over again. And finally I succumbed and I began acting like a winner. So I, you know, I thank you for that. But uh, what I've done, I think, I've tried to sort of pass it on. Dr. Hill told me on several occasions that his greatest fear was that he and his work would be forgotten. So especially in the last few years and now with the last protege that we're doing, uh, I've, I'm trying to make up for that, make sure that his work is not forgotten, nor what he taught me. As a mentor, a good mentor, I, I look at it like parenting. Uh, people come to me because they want to increase their sales, but we wind up talk we wind up talking about how to put their marriage back together. You know, some of both probably, but it drifts off. And the mentorship that I can uh, offer people is honesty. I will tell you the absolute truth. William Penn Patrick used to tell me. He said, "Ben, make sure that you always have a couple of people around you." who will tell you the absolute, there was another word in there that I'll skip over, truth. Uh, whether it hurts your feelings, whether it gets them fired or not. And uh, many of the people on that list of people who mentored me that you put up were of that nature. Uh, James H. Rucker Jr. was my running buddy in high school, turned in the world's, it, the, he was the finest salesperson I ever worked with. And although we were just beer drinking, girl chasing buddies to start with, he taught me a whole lot. Merle Frazier, who's on that list, most people who were listening to this have never heard of Merle. Merle was far wiser, more profound and funny uh, than almost any of my other mentors. He's a dear friend of mine who lives in uh, uh, Jackson, Mississippi, retired now. He's uh, got to be in his late 80s. And... Uh, just a wonderful guy. To this day, if I have a question or a problem or something that's highly personal, after I talk to Gigi, I call Merle. And wow. he's a, as soon as he sees my phone, he says, Brother Ben, what are we up to today? So you got to learn, A, seek him out, which I didn't do in the beginning. He was thrust on me. Then I started seeking him out. Seek him out. You Be mean seeking, seek out them. the mentors? That would, is that yeah. what you mean? Yeah, the ones who are mentoring me and then with the people that I have mentored over the years, a lot of them probably poorly because I didn't know I was a mentor. I was just being me and I wasn't being as careful as I should have been realizing people are watching. And if you're doing well, make a, uh, Lamont's goal was to get a, a big old Cadillac and a white fur coat and a floppy hat because that was who his mentors were. They ran the neighborhood. I've, somebody asked me the other day, what's the difference between you and Lamont, uh, where you met him and where he met you? And I said, zip code. I was raised two doors out, the, two uh, blocks out the front gate of East Lake Country Club. It's East Lake Golf Club, now Bobby Jones Home Course. Everybody I knew, my father and mother's friends, were the chairman of the board of Coca-Cola or Home Depot or this or that and so on. And his running buddies all own their own business, the largest jukebox distributing company, the largest this and so on. I grew up with that. Lamont grew up wanting to get a Cadillac, a gun, and uh, make money, which was drug selling. So a lot of it is you're a mentor, you don't know it. Be a deliberate mentor. In the last Protege, the program that Mark Harris and I have put together and are about to launch, uh, we have it broken down in modules. We're, we're leaving nothing to chance. You can pick your way through the forest, but we're leaving nothing to chance. And uh, the, uh, the value of that, I, I think what a mentor, I'm 76. And as you say, you know, I was attitude coach for the astronauts. And oh, yes. Well, I want to ask you about that in just a second. But, okay. um, but, but anyway, I've had those people astronauts, inmates, normal humans, and so on, and they're all the same. I, mean, I know things that I won't talk about because they're living relatives of some of these people, but I know things about some of these great, illustrious people that people are in awe of. Trust me, regular folks. I placed an order with the Nightingale Conant Corporation one day that saved them. I'd already agreed to place it, 
but I moved it up six months to save them. If they hadn't gotten the order, they'd have been out of business. So, you know, and that's not the image uh, Earl Nightingale has. He was this almighty, all-knowing. He was a regular guy, a wonderful guy, a wise guy with a voice I'd kill for. Uh, but uh, he was behind the scenes, a regular guy. That's wonderful when you can say that people are all the same, or at least we all, we all have the same air that we're breathing. We all have the same 24 hours in the same day. We all have the same, you know, hair, skin, eyes, and so forth. And it's what we do with those gifts. Um, right. One of the and things that I what, want to what, ask... Let me, let me jump yeah. in for just a split second. When I was teaching and working with the astronauts, Apollo 15, 16, 17 in particular, it was not significantly different than the work I did at Lompoc or the volunteer work I did at San Quentin. So I tell had, us how I that had, happened. How were you working with the astronauts? A friend of mine's wife was a holiday girl. We used to call them holiday magic cosmetics. And she liked me and, and I liked her husband. Jim was the launch test supervisor in the manned space program. And they asked if I wanted to come down and watch Apollo 4. It happened to be Apollo 14 take off the first shot after Apollo 13 had its problems. And we almost lost all the astronauts on that shot and go down and see it. Well, I thought, yeah, uh, you know, and pray that it gets off the ground. Well, the night I went down to watch Apollo, the day I went down to watch Apollo 14 take off the next day, that night they had a barbecue at their house and so we're going to have some guests over. Well, they have the launch and flight crews of Apollo 15, 16, 17 there. So I was, you know, if I'd had an autograph book, I'd have gotten it out. Well, they had built me up to such a point that the astronauts had their autograph books out. And they wanted to know, what do they do? They knew that being an astronaut and, the, and their days as fighter jockeys were over. Uh, once you go to the astronaut corps, that's something you used to do. Um, so they want to know, what do we do in business? How, you know, how do we do this? How do we do that? And I began coaching and mentoring some of those, the ones who were open and willing to it, and working with the top people at NASA, Dr. Miles Ross and Dr. Tevis, about some things they could do to get better funding for NASA and so on. And they, two of my more interesting clients, San Quentin State Prison and NASA, NASA share one thing in common. Neither one of them ever paid me a dime. <laughs> they were both that right? volunteer. Yeah. This is all volunteer. Yeah. Well, it, it, I didn't intend it to be, but with NASA, money never came up, and San Quentin said it would take two years. They wanted it, and they could get it approved probably in two to three years. I said, what if I do it for free? And Red Nelson, the warden, picked up his microphone. He said, are you serious? I said, yeah. And he said, uh, inmates, blah, blah, blah. I don't know how he qualified the first crowd meet in the Jewish chapel. Because if I do it for free, we could start that afternoon, and we did. I made up the name of the course, People Builders, walking from his office through the Sally Port to the Jewish Chapel. People so, build. so you created People Builders. Mm -hmm. And you're the man that we have, if, if anybody has ever dialed an 800 number, you're the one we can thank for that. Well, you, you can thank the phone company, but I was the one that made it affordable. Made it affordable. We yeah, can thank you, you for that. Yeah, I, I time shared the 800 service. Those phone 800 824 7888. I still have it. If you dialed it right now, my cell phone would ring uh, from 1976. Well, we, we, uh, I we, figured out a way to pay the phone company 10000 charge you $70, $75. But that's I also amazing. Had thousands of people using that same number. That's a brilliant idea, brilliant thinking. I, I've got a question for you from um, Bernie, who says, I've been trying to seek out a mentor in a multifamily real estate investing for years, unsuccessfully, only to come across um, gurus selling their own programs and products. I attend networking groups and real estate investment associations to no avail. Lastly, I can't afford to pay thousands to retain them, but I am more than willing to barter some time to assist them. Please provide some direction if possible. Go to the people, answer to all things like this is go to the people who've already been there and are doing it and they will give you an even better answer than I will. Write this down. What's his name? Bernie. Bernie. Uh, Bernie, write this down. Get in touch with Bruce Norris or his son, 
Aaron Norris at the Norris Group. They know everybody that's anybody in the real estate investment investing field. I've done numerous seminars for them over the years and asked them to also put you in touch with Tony Alvarez. Tony Alvarez, uh, a Cuban uh, American, great guy. And he started with, he started broke, 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 started with nothing and is extremely well to do today. If I had to, any concerns about real estate, investing, multifamily, flipping houses, whatever, I'd go to Bruce Norris or his son, Aaron. And, and so I guess you um, and Bernie can tell them that Ben Gay uh, uh, sent you. <laughs> is that all right, Ben? Yeah, it's okay. I, in all the right. old days, I would hope to then get a referral check, but nothing's ever happened. So I'll just send <laughs> more people to <laughs> Right. God I have another work. question here about um, what would be your top – Number five, five top picks of books that you would recommend reading today for somebody who wants to get ahead. Think and Grow Rich uh, would be one. Uh, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World by Harry Brown. Brown is spelled with an E on the end. He ran for president two or three times on the Libertarian ticket and now has passed away. But uh, Think and Grow Rich and How I Found Freedom in Unfree World. Then there's so many others. Uh, the Greatest Salesman in the World by Ogmandino and, and so on uh, would be excellent. But mainly what I do, and I've given a, a purchase and then saved them like trophies. And a few years ago, I started giving them away, floating around in this community or five or 6,000 of my books that I've given to libraries and churches and so on. And the one common denominator you'll find among most of them is they're about great people, people who achieved a lot. Cause that's how I've learned is I wasn't bright enough to learn when I was surrounded by them as a kid. So I had to read about them later. I wasn't bright enough to learn like I should have in, in high school. I got thrown out of public high school, was sent to a boarding school cause my family had money got thrown out of there, finished up and back in the public school. I first got thrown out of. So all around me were books in the library. I just don't remember ever going in them. So afterwards, I had to buy books and read them. And now I, I have five reading spots. There's one right here within arm's reach, five reading spots, one here in the office, one in my personal private bathroom. It's a small bathroom in the house. That's how come it became mine. Uh, one beside my bed stand. Uh, one in my briefcase and one in my car, five places. There's nowhere I can go that I'm more than an arm's length away from books. And I read, I put them on the, as they come in, I put them on the bottom of the stack, unless they're terribly interesting, in which case I'll cheat a little bit. And then I just read top to bottom. And the other secret of life is a bookmark. So you know where you are. You don't want a book after I'm done with it because I highlight it and mark it up and put a little slash to where I quit reading and the bookmarks in it and so on. So I might, the book in the, in the car right now, I probably haven't picked up in six months because I'm usually driving. Uh, but when I pick it up, I know right where I left off, the bookmarks in it. Now I, I can read a little bit. So people say, I don't have time to read. I, I could follow you around with a clipboard. And at the end of the day, I'd show you three hours you could have been reading. That's yeah, really interesting. Yeah, I well, don't you spend know, any time staring at my feet. You are you are an author of uh, twelve books, and I do want to acknowledge you for the books that you have written, and maybe for those who are interested in your books, um, they can go to a, a special place where you are providing your books uh, for our audience, and it's at stores.ebay.com forward slash. Ronzoni Books, and this is a place, folks, that you can get any of Ben Gay the Third's books that he has written. Again, he's written over 12 books, but you can get them here at the lowest price and also for with uh, free shipping. So I did want to give you that plug, but Thank um, you. one last thing I do Special want Special pricing and free shipping yes. only at that website. Only at this website, special pricing and free shipping stores.ebay.com forward slash Ronzoni books. And while we're on this topic, uh, you are beginning to uh, create something great. It's a new course. I know you're going to be um, maybe in the next month or two bringing out more information about this course, but it's called the last protege.com. And the reason I want to invite all of uh 
our, my patrons is to just go to the lastprotege.com and sign up there for more information because more information is going to be coming forth for a course that Ben Gay III will be teaching on what he has learned uh, being the last protege from Dr. Napoleon Hill. And it's really going to be a lot of, I'm sure, story shares like we're doing now. But tell us a little bit more about that program that's coming up, Ben. Well, Mark Harris, who's a great student of Dr. Hill, probably greater than anybody I've ever met. I mean, he, he knows Dr. Hill's material better than Dr. Hill knew it, because I used to discuss the material with Dr. Hill and frequently go, well, I don't remember what I wrote about that. Mark Harris knows what he wrote about it. Mark heard about me through a mutual friend, Clinton Smith, tracked me down and said, I understand you were the last protege of, uh, of uh, Dr. Hill. And I said, yep, last living. I don't know who was last last, if somebody talked to him on his last day maybe, but the last living protege. And I said, everybody else that runs around talking about thinking go rich, they have a book they bought at the bookstore and they don't know, many of them don't know any more about him than they would if they bought the book and just studied it and highlighted it and marked it up. So we formed a, a partnership, which is wonderful. He's a student of the material. Mark Harris is far greater than I am, but he knows the books. I knew the man. So we have a wonderful blend of things. Uh, he knows what Dr. Hill uh, says you should do in the books blended with Dr. Hill saying, okay, well, that was interesting, but here's what I really meant, or if I had to write it over again, here's what I would do. And uh, so we bring together that blend and we put it, we're putting it together. It's, we're doing a final, final take, recorded take on two or three of the first things this week, and then we'll be ready to start out. But if you go to the lastprotege.com, no cost, no obligation. They only ask for your first name and email address. We will automatically keep you up to date and you can jump on the train if you want now or in the future. We were talking about protege earlier and uh, you know, mentoring and so on. If I have an advantage over many people and uh, A, I'm aware, I know that I know that I know that helps. Uh, I'm 76 and had an opportunity to hang out with those wonderful people you had shown on the list that became my buddies. They taught me a lot. Most of them worked for me uh, through some fluke. <laughs> I was in the right place at the right time. But what we offer is you're starting out or you're halfway through your journey and so on. You say you would say if you bumped into somebody in the jungle with a jungle hat on, looked like it had some mud on them and so on, coming back down the path, you'd say, what's back there? That's, that's what you'd want to know. I'm the guy with the jungle hat, the mud on him, who's been down there and back and down there and back. And I can tell you what's down there and I can tell you the mistakes I made and that Dr. Hill made and that Earl Nightingale made and Doug Edwards made and so on, all the way down that line. I know them because they told me. So I, what I can do is short circuit, uh, probably take, if you're younger, I can take 20 years off your learning curve. Wow, well, that's, that's worth a lot. And so I just want to encourage everybody, this is this is amazing opportunity. Ben Gay III will be um, creating this course. We'll just, um, just go, go to lastprotege.com and sign up for more information. That's all, all you have to do, and you'll get right. more information, and then you can decide if you're really interested in taking the course. I know I'm going to be taking the course, and I want to give a quick shout-out to my friend, um, Denise Griffiths, who uh, put in the chat here the um, website, if anybody's interested in how to get in touch with the Norris group, which you had mentioned earlier, Super. Ben. Uh, so thank you for that, Denise. Um, and thank you, Denise, for everything that you've done for me and for Ben Gay III. I know that you are um, uh, very much a supporter of his, and we appreciate And, and vice versa. Uh, that's I right, vice versa. Him. And she brought us together. That's right, she did. Um, for that, I'm very grateful. And just, I know that we've gone over a little bit, Ben, but it's been wonderful to have you with us today. I so appreciate who you are, um, who you have, where you have been. I mean, where you have been, it has given you all 
of the, the dust and grit of the journey, but also the gifts that you have to bring and share with all of us as the great mentor that you are. And I just want to thank you because um, it comes from your heart. We can tell that. Um, you have the lessons of life within you. And we, we just wish you the very, very, very best on not only this new program, the last protege that you'll be um, introducing to the world, and we hope to give you all the, all the best luck on that, but in life and in every way with your marriage, with Gigi, with fun in your life and, and great, great health, we wish to you. And thank you so much for being a part of the Master Mentor Series. Thank you, Lynn. Anytime. And with that, I'd like to say good night and thank you all to my, for, to, uh, to my patrons for being with us. And stay tuned for my next guest who will be, guess who? In the tradition of mentors, we spoke a lot about Earl Nightingale tonight. And we will, I will be, I have the privilege and honor of interviewing Earl Nightingale's daughter, Pamela Nightingale. So stay tuned. I'll be sending out notices of when that's going to be, and that'll be an exciting time as well. So with that in mind, let's all not only get a mentor, have a mentor, and be a mentor to be your best. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night.